Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. If you'll please take your seat, we're about ready to get started. My name is Becky Womble, and I'm the president and CEO of the Bastrop Chamber of Commerce. And it's my it's my privilege to welcome you here tonight for our Bastrop Votes Initiative. This initiative came out of our Government Affairs Committee um, back in December and was approved by our board on December 16th, just two days after these gentlemen before you uh, filed to, vote, to run for these offices. Um, it is also supported by the other two chambers in our community, or in our county, the Elgin Chamber and the Smithville Chamber. The purpose of this initiative is one thing, and it's to promote the vote in Bastrop County. Our goal is to be a resource for fair, impartial, and informative information about the candidates seeking elected office in Bastrop County. This forum tonight is especially important because these candidates before you, this is their general election. There's no Democratic opponent for this race. The Republican primaries will be your only opportunity to vote for seat 17 of our House of Representatives. It is an extremely exciting time to be part of Bastrop because we have new challenges and new opportunities as growth comes our way and new waters to navigate. These, di these times are very dynamic and they they require us to work together as not only a county, but a five county region that is represented. Before I get started, I'd like to ask you to silence your cell phones. I'd also ask you to limit your up and in and out of the auditorium tonight because it's very distracting for the candidates and the people around you. I don't know why I'm so nervous. I think I'm more nervous than y'all are. <laughs> um, I also want to remind our candidates that to speak clearly into your microphones because this is being live streamed for our folks at home and I want the audience to be able to hear you. I want to introduce a few people that are helping us tonight. First, Bernie Jackson. She's on round three of the forums. She's going to keep us on track tonight with our timekeeping. And then I'd like to introduce our moderator who's been called on the streets of Bastrop, the moderator. Her name is Laura Klein. Laura and her husband own Klein and Company, a CPA firm in Lockhart, Texas. She's a past president of the League of Women Voters and has a lot of experience in moderating forums. So I'd like to turn the mic over to Laura Klein. Oh. <laughs> yes, go ahead give her a hand. Um, also, um, I've been asked several times about the questionnaires. We will uh, take those up before the last question that's going to be asked. So if you'll just hold on to them, we'll make an announcement so everybody can turn them at one time. Ms. Laura Klein. Thank you, Becky. The purpose of this forum is to provide those candidates who have an opponent in the primary with an opportunity to answer questions of interest to voters. I'd like to present the criteria under which this forum will be held tonight. Questions have not been made available to the candidates in advance questions which I will be asking have been selected by me from a list posed by panel members and rewritten for consistency and clarity by volunteers. Each candidate will be allotted the following. A two-minute opening statement, a two-minute response to each question followed by a 30-second rebuttal by the first to answer the question, and a two-minute closing statement. Opening statements will begin with Mr. Sirier. Closing statements will begin with Mr. Goldman. There will be no rebuttals to either closing or opening statements. The questions will be answered in alphabetical order. The first question will begin with the second person to make his opening statement. Subsequent questions will alternate between the candidates in alphabetical order. To allow time for closing statements, eight to 10 questions are planned. If time permits, questions will be taken from the audience. Questions from the floor must be submitted in writing and may or may not be utilized based upon the time constraints or the appropriateness of the question as determined solely by the moderator. Audience members are asked not to respond with applause or audible statements during the forum. Now we'll begin our opening statements with Mr. Sirier. Serving as your state representative has been one of the most rewarding experiences of my life. Let me tell you a little bit about myself for those of you who don't know me. I'm John Sirier. I'm founder and CEO of Sabre Commercial, a commercial general contracting company. Today I have 52 full-time employees. 
I've twice been nominated for CEO of the year, and my company is among the top 10 best places to work and top 50 fastest growing companies in Central Texas. I am a businessman, not a politician. I ran for state representative in the special election last year because I know I can make a difference in our communities and for our state. Taxes. After you elected me, I rolled up my sleeves and got to work. I co-authored one of the biggest tax cuts in Texas history, including $1.2 billion in tax cuts to property taxes and 25% uh, percent cut to one of the most common small business tax, border. I co-authored the strongest border security plan in the United States, our water, and I passed new legislation to protect our groundwater from water marketers who want to export it elsewhere. And of course, I was honored to help bring our community together to start healing after the Hidden Pines fires and host Governor Abbott at a fundraiser that pulled in over $84,000, enough to build, rebuild two new homes. My opponent has been running against me for over a year and on this third election. That is his right. It is also my right to share about the contrast between the two men you see before you. He has proven he will say anything to win a vote. He has lied about our successful defense of our local groundwater. He even said all I did was fly over the Hidden Pines fires, which is very low to say about a person who has left his home early in the morning, came home late, smelling like smoke every day for over a week. I have endured enough of his dishonesty that it is time to call a spade a spade. Voters have the right to hear the truth. Thank you for the opportunity, and I look forward to the discussion this evening. Mr. Goldman. Um, my name is Brent Goldman. I uh, want to thank uh, Laura for being here and doing this. Uh, Pastor Bernie, thank you for taking up your time, and Becky and the rest of the chambers for putting on this event. Uh, I'd also like to pay special recognition to my family, my wife Cynthia, and our four children Grant, Chandler, CIC Moss, Savannah, and Katerina. Yes, they're all there. Um, I um, raise your hand if you actually believe that our state and our country are moving in the right direction with respect to, say, immigration, education, tax policy. See, I don't believe it is as well. I believe that we have some, uh, we have some work to do in these areas. If you listen to you know, what's been sort of sent a lot in the mail, you'd think that all the problems have been solved, but they, they really haven't. We have, uh, as John pointed out, a, a real contrast between the two of us. We're two different gentlemen, two different backgrounds, and two different focuses on what we envision the state to look like. So throughout the course of this evening, I hope we can certainly tell the differentiators between that. Um, my focus is, is, you know, grassroots. I've knocked on over 6,600 doors, and I will hit 7,000, because I believe it requires going out and meeting the people. When we had the short election, I hit almost 2,000 doors. So that was, you know, where my base. John's more of an establishment. He certainly has the money and the backing he had in the first race and he does in this race. Just differences between us. Uh, we have uh, a grow government sort of mentality versus a more limited government mentality. Uh, th we're going to see tonight, and I hope that through the course of this, that, that y'all are able to tell the differences between the two of us and that we're able to bring them out in a civil manner. Thank you. The first question will start with Mr. Goldman. What are the three top issues facing House District 17, and how would you address them? Uh, three top issues facing uh, the district would be, uh, for us, uh, certainly one would be groundwater, another one would be education, and the third one that I would uh, put out there is government, just the growth of government and understanding that falls into tax policy. So I'll start, since I have two minutes, with just the, the first one. Groundwater is one that uh, we have, we need to maintain local control of. And one of the things that took place in the last session, if you all remember, is that there was John's trumpeting a groundwater bill. He calls it the strongest groundwater bill ever. But it's really tort reform. Tort reform is lawsuit reform. When I was in law school, we went through this. If you go to the Texas lawsuit, Texas, for lawsuit reform website right now, you'll see they trumpet it as one of the best lawsuit reform bills. It does not do anything to protect our groundwater. And I, if we go, if we look at it right now and you say, John did file two very good bills on groundwater. And those bills 
one of them passed out of the House on the last day because it was dead in the Senate. That bill, when it was in the House committee, had many marketers going against it. The bill that John did pass, the lawsuit reform bill, had no water mar marketers testify against it. So one of the differences here between us, and we'll get more into groundwater, is that if I'm in office, I'll be more effective about getting legislation across. John never attempted to put either of those two groundwater bills on the House floor onto any other bills that were passing. That is typical standard strategy. If you want to be an effective advocate, you've got to take those bills, and you know you're not going to get them out of committee, and you know you're not going to get them because the, the water marketers are fighting you, so you try to attach them to bills on the House floor. Not once did he attempt to do that. What I'm saying is filing a bill is, is fine and good, but that's not advocacy. Advocacy is effectively trying to pass the bill, and that is something that's very important. And I'll circle back around my time's up with respect to the other two issues. Mr. Serrier? Well, I know we're going to have a lot of discussions about water tonight, so I can't wait to rebut all those misinformation again and lies that he's saying about me and the untruths about our bills that we did for uh, our local groundwater and the local control of our groundwater. But I will say the, the needs for District 17 are, are very similar to what's in the state. Uh, we are very fortunate with the counties of Lee, Bastrop County, Caldwell County, Gonzales, and Carnes. If you think about those five rural counties, it is a, uh, it, we are very fortunate with our natural resources. Uh, up here, obviously, we've talked about groundwater and the aquifers in the top, top two counties, but the aquifers go all the way down. Um, just saw 15 seconds. Do, it, do I have my mm -mm. full? No. no. I'm sorry. Um, so the aquifers go all the way down through our, our counties. But also, too, if you th uh, think about Gonzales and Carnes, they are the top, the top uh, one and number five uh, number one oil producers, not only in the 254 counties in Texas, but in the United States. This is uh, extremely important for not only obviously District 17, but also for, for the rest of the state and the rest of our nation. I'm sorry. Well, I, that, okay. I got Ms. Jackson, we're doing two minutes each and then a 30 second rebuttal. Okay. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> we'll get this timing down. I thought I was talking too fast. <laughs> so wh what's important for District 17? Uh, diversification of our jobs. Um, you know, obviously the oil and gas industry, we've seen these cycles. We knew the cycles would be coming. This is a, uh, we're fortunate. It's none like the 1980s where we hit, hit rock bottom and it took out just about everybody. Uh, we have diversified, but we need to continue to diversify. Also, too, education is extremely important. We'll talk more about education later, later today, I'm sure, but education is extremely important for our five rural counties. It is much different, our public education is much different than what it is in Houston, Dallas-Fort Worth, San Antonio, or in El Paso, or even any other city, or even Austin to our, to our west. Education, I also will say infrastructure, uh, water being a uh, one of them, but also the infrastructure for our roads uh, to, to be able to handle the growth, but also to the uh, uh, infrastructure of water in terms of finding new sources of uh, water in terms of conservation and the way we use our water. Okay, Mr. Goldman, you have 30 seconds for a rebuttal. Do I have to rebut or I just No, it? I mean, the time is provided for you to rebut what he has just said. You have 30 seconds. If you don't uh, want to use it, that I, I time. would. I would. I would. Education of a child does not differ based upon where you're located. That's like saying tax cuts only work in cities, but they don't work in rural areas. Raising a child is about a parent's responsibility, God-given responsibility, to foster and make sure that that child has all the resources that they need in order to be educated. It's not the state's responsibility, it's a parental responsibility, and it doesn't make a difference where you live. Okay, question number two will begin Mr. Syria. Will you work across party lines in the legislature to bring about good policies, and how would you achieve that? Uh, yes, and I have proven that. Um, so House Bill 3163, which my opponent just brought up, it was the, uh, the stop personal lawsuits against members of water conservation districts. We saw that here in uh, Lost Pines Groundwater Conservation District where they were using coercion, coercion, not, not good policy, they were using coercion to get their, their water groundwater permits. 
that lawsuit would have been going on for several years. Our bill, which I have to say was not, not just a creation for myself, but it was brought to us with local help through uh, Bastrop Commissioner's Court, Lee County Commissioner's Court, grassroots efforts, uh, independent Texans, citizens. We put that bill together to, uh, that, that stopped, uh, this, stopped those lawsuits. The governor signed that, that bill in uh, mid-June, two weeks before it was signed those personal lawsuits were dropped. Uh, to say that that was not a strong uh, bill is, is untrue. It was extremely strong. As a matter of fact, others have introduced me as the one that has fought for local control for groundwater. Mr. Goldman. I, I'm going to go back to that with respect to groundwater in that particular piece of legislation. I'm all against frivolous lawsuits. When people sue doctors, <clears throat> certainly, I don't, I'm not in favor of doctors being sued frivolously, but that doesn't make your health care better. Same here. Our groundwater is no more protected today than it was next. Lawyers, I have a law degree, yes. That's a typical legal ploy. They can still use it. They'll use all the money they need. They'll just simply attack the entire board and try to bankrupt small and groundwater districts with boards that way. The ploy has not been taken away from lawyers. Now, in terms of the passage of that bill, nobody testified against it that was a water marketer. Nobody, because they didn't care. It had five people vote against it on the House floor. Again, nobody really worried if there were a water marketer. It got to the Senate. One person voted against it in the Senate. If it were something that water marketers really were worried about, like they were with John's 3116, the historic use of groundwater, they came out of the woodworks. They showed up. They didn't even let his other bill, 3161, get a hearing. That's, those are good bills on water. They went nowhere. Now, 3116, John will, will say, well, yeah, it got out of the house. Yeah, it got out of the house on the last day, on the local and consent calendar. And let me explain what local and consent means. That means that it went on, all it took was one member of the house to stand up and talk it to death for 10 minutes. But yet, no water marketer with all their big dollars needed to worry about it, and they didn't even stand up and try to kill it. And the reason they didn't, because they knew it didn't have a Senate sponsor, and it didn't have a Senate companion, so it was going nowhere the day that it left that house. So it was effectively dead and not even worth their time. I mean, this is where I come to the table. I have been in seven legislative sessions. I've run a legislative information service. I know how to effectively pass legislation. The way John went about doing it is not effective. Mr. Serrier, you have a 30-second rebuttal. Uh, not being effective is not what I've been told. And matter of fact, matter of the, uh, the statements that I've been called was pit bull, unbelievable that a freshman would bring up legislation in front of the House floor, work it through not only once, but twice through Natural Resource Committee. That bill was sponsored by uh, Senator Watson. And to go back to your original question about working together, Senator Watson picked that bill up because he also realized how important it was for our district. Sure, the water marketers may, may not have come to that, that meeting because they knew how hard we were going to fight against them and they knew they were going to lose. In terms of saying that I didn't push it through amendments, uh, actually House Bill 3163 did get amended, put on an amendment late one night, and I got that one through twice. It did go through an amendment. My other bill, 3116, was also asked to put on that amendment. Thank you. Third question. We'll begin with Mr. Goldman. With House District 17 constituents growing concern over possible scarcity of future water supplies, should this state revisit the 1904 rule of capture? If so, what changes would you propose, and if not, why? I am not a fan of, of changing the rule of capture. I believe the rule of capture has a large body of law around it, and it certainly has a lot, uh, a lot of uh, law around it with respect to other minerals that we've got, oil, gas, things of that nature. But what does need to come into play is better control, local control, of how we regulate and manage the rule of capture. Those are the things that have been chipped away over the course of the last 10 to 12 years since groundwater districts were put in place. You know, going about and revisiting the rule of capture opens up a can of worms that we just don't want to open up. We have too large a body of law with respect to oil and gas, and what we just simply don't have right now is a body of law with respect to groundwater. 
Now, I will state as well, that I'll make sure I was clear, and we good thing we're recording this. I agree that House Bill 3163 went through, the lawsuit reform bill went through the legislature fine and was put on as amendment. I was talking about House Bill 3116 and House Bill 3161, the actual what I call groundwater bills. So when I, when I also get back to understanding a little bit about, say, well, how does Brent get to play Monday morning quarterback? Well, you know, I would, that's, an avid, that's a valid question. For seven years, for seven, pardon me, seven sessions, I either worked at the Texas legislature in the Texas House or the Texas Senate, or after upon graduating law school, I ran a legislative information service. If you were a, any trade practitioner, a lawyer, lobbyist, member of the legislature, uh, trade association, and you wanted information, you purchased it from our service. I had 30 to 35 employees scouring the Capitol from 6 a.m. to usually 4 a.m. because we were up with the earliest committee and went to bed with the latest committee following every little aspect of the Texas House and the Texas Senate. So I know more than just one body. I know both sides. I have a very in-depth knowledge, and that's the, what I want to bring to this district, is I believe that knowledge can help us because we have a serious fight ahead of us. Thank you. Mr. Syria. Well, first of all, I, I noticed that my opponent did not speak on the part about how to work with others. So I would uh, make note of that. On local, uh, on uh, rule of capture, uh, it is a very complicated um, um, issue when we start dealing with, with groundwater. Um, it is my intent to keep the local control, having our groundwater districts make those decisions on our permits. Um, if we start getting into rule of capture, then that's when we're going to start losing our water, and that's when the damage to our aquifers would occur. So I would oppose going to the rule of capture and prefer to the uh, local control method. Mr. Goldman, you have a 30-second rebuttal if you choose to use it. Uh, okay. Let it go. Okay. Yeah. Question number four. Should the state put more funding and resources toward wildfire mitigation and disaster preparation? If so, what is your proposal, Mr. Syria? And the answer is yes. Um, Texas has the most natural disasters in the United States, and I'm afraid uh, our district, and especially here in Bastrop County, has seen their fair shares. We have, uh, I am, I'm fortunate to be on uh, the Land and Resource Committee, House Land and Resource Committee, where I've been asked to be in an oversight committee to look at Texas natural disasters and how we are prepared for that. Uh, after spending, uh, uh, as a county commissioner, as a former county commissioner in Caldwell County during the 2011 fires, I assisted our firefighters during that, during that uh, event and also flew aerial observations here in Bastrop County between the complex fire in the Del Ha fire in Caldwell County. With that experience, it helped prepare me for what we encountered back in October with the Hidden Pines fire. And the devastation is just uh, incredible to see it again, and I know everybody knows what I'm talking about. There is a, uh, a local group, and members are here today, that have asked me to be a part of a citizens uh, coalition to look at our preparedness, to see what, what went right, to see what we could do better. And also, too, what I think is very important is to see uh, how we can better inform the citizens when natural disasters occur, besides wildfires, when, when the floods come, that we can update and get our members and our citizens uh, aware of that. So I am all for uh, working on and look forward to the interim committees that I have been assigned to and making sure that not only Bastrop County, our District 17, but the state of Texas is better prepared for these natural disasters. Mr. Goldman? Um, I'm all for taking money and appropriating it to use it where it's needed. The problem we have, folks, in this state is over the last decade, our state debt has grown to be almost $43 billion. It's over 100% increase. Our local bonded indebtedness is third. We're only behind California and New York, and we just moved to third. We have a debt problem here in the state of Texas. So when we talk about how we're going to move funds around and what we're going to do, if you send me to the legislature, and this is the big difference between John and I, I'm going to say we need to do it out of revenues that we've collected. We don't need to do it through debt. John voted for tuition revenue bonds. That's $3 billion more billion of debt. 
I vote no on that. I, what I would say, you need money, figure out how to get it out of general revenue, but we're not going to go into more debt because sending ourselves into more debt is not, you know, oil prices don't always go up. They actually someday go down. We're looking at a fact right now because of oil prices. I read just the other day, Glenn Hager said there's a lawsuit pending and that there may have to be a $4.4 billion tax refund that will wipe out all the oil and gas uh, revenues that we've collected over the last biennium. So when you're talking about, well, how are you going to appropriate funds for it's nice to say, hey, yeah, let's just throw money at this, throw money at that. But understand, we're incurring a lot of debt, and we need some serious people to understand that. I'm also not in favor of um, a lot of the things that John voted for. I mean, for example, he had the, uh, a retroactive payment to the, um, to the trust fund that this is, you know, one of the funds that we were going to go back and pay people. This is corporate welfare. I'm not going to vote for corporate welfare. The, we had a vote to defund the enterprise fund. That's more corporate welfare. John was in favor of it. This is a big difference between us. I literally think we need to get our debt under control. Mr. Serrier, you have a 30-second rebuttal. Uh, the enterprise fund, which uh, my opponent brought up, I voted no against that, and we eliminated the enterprise fund. But I want to go back and let you guys know, I will always fight for District 17. And when you're out there and you spend days out there and your eyes are watering and you're meeting people that have lost their homes for the second time, you're meeting people that have lost everything that they own, my eyes were watering because of the smoke, but it was also watering because the citizens of this county have suffered too much. I will, I will work and fight hard to find those funds and help protect Bastrop County. Thank you. Question number five. We'll begin with Mr. Goldman. Do you think illegal immigration is a federal responsibility, or should the state lead the charge? And if so, how? Well, it's certainly a federal responsibility, but the state has many things that we can do to step up. And this is one of those areas where we've seen leadership out of the Texas Senate because it's gone conservative, but in the Texas House, our leadership continues to lag behind. We've had sanctuary city legislation to do away with sanctuary cities. It does, gives, gets no traction in the House because of House leadership. Uh, we have uh, you know, the strong border legislation that was passed through both houses. And I might add, uh, John did mention in his opening remarks that he was a co-author, he and 89 other people. Uh, lots of times when you co-author, there seems to be about 90 or 100 other people on there as well, because John knows, as I know, the only thing you have to do to co-author is sign a piece of paper. But on what we really need to focus on is getting rid of subsidies. That's another one, subsidies to illegal immigrants. Unfortunately, that gets no traction in the Texas House. We have a leadership in the Texas House, and John and I sit on polar opposite sides of that. We have a leadership in the Texas House that does not want to see conservative legislation like you see in the, in the Texas Senate get through. The strongest pro-life bill of last session flew out of the Texas Senate, died in the Texas House. We had seven, uh, eight education reform bills come out of the Texas Senate. Only one of them got out of the Texas House. I mean, you, you need to understand that there is a, there's sort of a battle going on here between those that are truly fiscally conservative and tr those that are socially conservative versus those who want to stay with more of an establishment. This is the, this is the juxtaposition we have. Mr. Sirian, you want me to repeat the question? Uh, yes, please. Okay. Do you think illegal immigration is a federal responsibility or should the state lead the charge, and if so, how? It is a federal responsibility, and um, let me start with uh, the House was took the initiative. It was a House bill that put $830 million for border security. That was a lack of our federal government protecting our borders. We talk a lot about uh, we talk a lot about uh, refugees coming into our country. That is a slow process. That is a slow process that that takes time, and I agree. We need to vet that more cl uh, clearly. Last month, I spent, spent a day down on the border, and I spent time with our Texas troopers and, that, are, that are deployed down there. This is the first national border security plan uh, ever created, and it started in the House. I, and I am proud to be a co-author on that. There was 8,000 bills, by the way. Let me just say that there was 8,000 bills that were introduced in the 84th legislative session. Mr. Goldman's brought up three or four let's say 10 
bills that he says that did not come through the through the house. There was 8,000 bills. There were several thousand bills that both houses didn't look at, didn't have time to get through. There's a good reason why we only spent 140 days in session, because we do not want 8,000 bills to be approved in the state. Mr. Goldman, you have a 30-second rebuttal. Um, I will point out that there are certainly a lot of bills that go through the House and Senate and concede that point. But when they are the Lieutenant Governor's number one priority bills, there are a very small number of those. And when those find themselves dead in the Texas House, that means you've got a completely different viewpoints there. Everybody knew what those bills were. They were high priority. They didn't find any priority in the Texas House. Now, the last thing on the, you know, with immigration, and my follow-up would be on sanctuary cities, that there was a, a letter written from the Texas Conservative Caucus that was supporting Governor Abbott's stand on eliminating sanctuary cities. John and a number of other Republicans chose not to sign that letter. Thank you. Question number six. With the continued population growth in District 17, how can you as a state representative help with the inherent problems this creates, such as increased traffic? We'll begin with Mr. Syria. We are experiencing the, uh, the demands on our infrastructure. Obviously, tr uh, traffic and roads is uh, one of the top ones. For many of us in District 17, at least especially in these northern counties of Lee and Bastrop and Caldwell County, over 60% of us travel uh, outside of our county for work. As a county commissioner, I represented Caldwell County on CAMPO, which is our MPO, which divvies up the funding for, from TxDOT and also from the federal government on our roads and, and road projects. On that executive committee, which I was on for five years, I was fortunate to work with Bastrop County with Clara Beckett, Commissioner Beckett, on that committee and see and understand how it, what it takes to get money, uh, money for these infrastructure projects. I became pretty much an expert in the transportation field and working on roads and working on how to, how to get those funds to our region. Um, it is a, uh, it's, it's important to realize, just like on anything, on any project, you can't get that by fighting. You can't get that by only being one-sided. Those dollars we actually, for Bastrop County and for Caldwell County, we actually got over our allotted share of those dollars coming this way. I'm proud to say as I travel through Bastrop, I can see some of the projects that we work together to, to, with those funds and that we're seeing those, those good projects come to use. So in transportation, it is one of our big needs. I brought it up earlier because I feel like that is going to be one of the things that we've got to be ahead of. We've seen the city of Austin push away transportation, which has only caused more headaches and has reduced our quality of life. Mr. Goldman. Well, as, as a legislator, I mean, one of the things that we need to do is change the way in which we go about allowing contracting from the Texas, tech stock, Texas Department of Transportation. We have a system that is a, uh, a design, bid, build, system of, of building roads. So one person designs it, then we bid it out for somebody else to actually build it. It would be much more efficient. It's been proposed many times, and it's unfortunately not getting traction. It needs traction to say we just have a design. The person that designs it can actually build it. Let's cut out the middleman. It'll t cut down time to get these projects out. It'll also, as well, uh, cut down some of the costs. Because some of the costs are factored into this, it happened to be layered on because the person who is building it didn't design it, so it feels like they got to spend a little extra money to make it right. So that's one of the things that I would propose that we do. Another thing that we need to do is look at, you know, keeping and making sure and maybe even making constitutionally sure that we actually keep funds dedicated. You know, for the first time in a long time in the Texas legislature, we're actually taking dedicated funds and using them for the purposes that that they were set out to be. But there's a very, every time we get into a recession, every time we get into a, a dip in our little economy, the politicians in Austin all want to run and start pulling out of funds. And one of the funds they always want to pull out of is transportation. And we need to do more to make sure that we protect against that because I've been there and I've watched it happen many times. And I'm afraid that we still have that, they still have the opportunity and we st that still could happen. Mr. Syria, you have a 30-second rebuttal. I was part of the, uh, the, the group that helped 
put a constitutional amendment uh, together for $4 billion of funds that we've dedicated to transportation. Uh, those earmarks that were set aside that were supposed to be originally going to transportation, I voted on to remove those off of that to put those monies back into transportation into our roads and our structure, infrastructure. Thank you. Question number seven, we'll begin with Mr. Goldman. As a Texas state representative, the salary is $7,200 a year. That Why much? do you want the job? Uh, I have four ch children, <laughs> every dollar counts. Uh, no, I mean, <clears throat> I'm, I stepped out of, um, out of sort of the political process, so to speak, having run a legislative information service in many states in Washington, D.C. for about 12 years. I sold that business. And, you know, everybody, I mean, there seemed to be an insinuation in the last race that since my dad is a, a lobbyist, and really he's a more of an expert witness that testifies from time to time for clients before the legislature in the oil and gas business, that I am somehow impugned by being a lobbyist. Well, I can tell you folks, when you step away from a business where you know all the stakeholders have followed every last little piece of legislation for 14 years, and the first thing you want to do is grow a beard, move out to the piney woods, and live in a log cabin, that ought to tell you I have no desire to, to ever be a lobbyist. And, you know, so for me, getting back to this is, is to serve. I truly believe I bring a skill set that we need. We are a rural county. Urbans are growing. There are more people in urban areas than there are in rural areas. We need strong advocacy and, and effective advocacy because we won't have the votes. There are lots of things that can be done in the process because too many people go up there and don't understand it. They don't approach it with a mindset the way that a lobbyist does. And I understand that. And I believe I can bring that to the table. And it's my desire to, to truly serve. I'm knocking 7,000 doors, meet, reaching out and meeting you, and I knocked 2,000 the last time because my heart is that of service. You can check the community service record. Cynthia and I moved out here, and we've invested in our community, and we love you know, this community, and we want to be a part. I've started businesses out here. This is, you know, where we want to be and who we want to serve. So that's why I want $7,200. Is that much? Is that much? Mm -hmm. Wow. Mr. Siria. Yeah, as, as it's been said, it's definitely not for the money, but it is for the love of the, and serving people. Um, as I found this out is when I was appointed as a county commissioner that I could use my experiences uh, from business from the nonprofit worlds, the being a being a chairman of several nonprofits, working on different boards and different life experiences, that I could use those experiences to help help my community. And as a former county commissioner, I learned real quick that those those uh, serving people and being able to see that uh, seeing that the results of the hard work and uh, meant a lot to me. It was fruitful work. Being as your state rep. It has just enlightened me that much more. The people are so good. Uh, from Lee County all the way down to Carnes County, it's just been a joy to work with everybody. We're, we're good people. We're all the same. We're rural communities. We care about our children. We care about our schools. We care about our quality of life. It is, uh, I, I've worked very hard at this. I've, I've put a lot into this. I'm very fortunate because I have a, uh, a wife that uh, allows me to do this because it takes many sacrifices. It's a lot of sacrifices. A lot of sacrifices on myself, but I'm the one that asked to do this. It's the sacrifices on my wife and my co-workers. I've got uh, one here today, that, 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 uh, but we have several of our, my full-time workers that are here, uh, co-workers that are here living in his constituents as well in Bastrop County. They're the ones that make the sacrifice, and I'm appreciative for them to allow me to do so. Um, it is very rewarding because it's rewarding of, uh, of, of the service and giving back. And the Texas history part of it has uh, also been nice to be a part of Texas history and be a part of, uh, uh, be a part of that, this great state. Mr. Goldman, you have a 15, uh, 30 second rebuttal if you choose no, to. No, oh, okay. I won't rebut. Okay. Money. All right, question number eight goes to Mr. Serrier first. Oh, you want to stop now? If you want to, that's fine. I'm ready to do number eight. If you'll pass your questions down to the aisle, uh, 
these gentlemen will come pick them up. Thank you. All right, Mr. Siri. If there is anything you could change from your first term, what would it be? If I could change anything, I would love to have had a full term. I would have loved to have had time to get into the uh, uh, session a uh, little bit more prepared. Because of the runoff, we ended up only having nine days to file legislation. We also only had nine days to set up our office, to get our, our capital office going. We were very fortunate, though, because we had a great team, a team of Melissa Nemechek as our chief of staff, who spent 19 years in that capital. We're, we're also privileged to have Alonzo Wood, who has spent six years also in the district, who lives up in Lee County. If we had more time, I know we could do more, but we accomplished a lot in a short period of time. That's why I'm very excited about the opportunity and the possibility to continue on as your state representative and have an actual full term uh, to, to finish up the work that we've started. Mr. Goldman. No, repeat the question. The question of Mr. Serie was, if there is anything you could change from your first term, what would it be? So you have an opportunity to respond to what he said. Um, you know, I, I, would, I would say that there would be certain uh, things or votes that were cast that if I were in the legislature, I would not have cast the same way as John. One of them is uh, House Bill 37. House Bill 37 is a bill that would ask uh, nonprofits, that includes churches, to report their tithings or their monies that, that donors give if they participate in anything that's deemed to be a political event. So let's say the bathroom ordinance down in Houston. You had a lot of churches step up and say, we don't want transgender bathrooms. And they got out, and they marched, and they sent out flower, flyers, and they spent money. This bill would say, you know what? Some of, your, some of your folks that tithe more than a certain amount of money are going to have to report that to the state. Now, I know John's talked about religious freedoms, but to me, that's horrible legislation. That has no place to be in the Texas legislative process. And it passed the Texas House, and it died in the Texas Senate because it was going nowhere in a conservative Senate but it flew out of a Texas house. And John not only voted for it, he co-authored it. I'm not gonna co-author that bill. I'm not gonna co-author a bill that says that anybody's tithes, no matter what, have to go be reported to the government. Now, the other one that I would say that you know, I wouldn't vote for, and there, there are several on there, but John voted on a bill that was filed by, in, in, by some of the most liberal folks in the Texas house, and that was food stamps to felons. Now let's understand, we're talking about providing food stamps to people who have committed some, you know, that sold drugs, meth labs, all that kind of stuff. And that when they stepped out, you know, I think we need to be providing more of our funds. We have limited funds, folks. They don't need to be going to felons. They need to be going to veterans. They need to be going to the, to the elderly. They need to be going to different places. They certainly don't need to be going to felons. And those, are, those are kind of some of the differences I would have had if I had been in the legislature last session. Mr. Syria. First of all, let's set this record straight. I did not vote for that House Bill 37. It was the governor's ethics bill as it came in. Yes, I did co-author it when I first got into the House. The ethics bill was to clean up campaign, uh, campaign dark money, but the bill got hijacked. It got hijacked on the floor. It was a very late evening, and the bill w ended up changing from what originally original intent was. And if you check the record, Brent, I voted no against that bill, and I stopped and I withdrew my support of that. Okay, n number nine may s not be necessary, but I'll read it anyway. Uh, it was to begin with Mr. Goldman. Uh, what would you have done differently than Mr. Syria in his first oh, term? <laughs> lots. We can. I think we kind of been there. Yeah. But no, if but you want to, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll okay. go on. I mean, John and I have a different approach to fiscal. You know that. The Texas House and the Texas Senate had two different approaches to how we would solve funding. The House said, we want sales tax reduction. The Senate said, we want property tax reduction. John signed a letter along with a lot of other Republicans, I might add, I wouldn't have been on that letter, that argued for sales tax reduction over a property tax reduction. But let me explain to you why that is not good fiscal policy. Because, see, property taxes 
are paid by property owners. Sales taxes are paid by illegal immigrants. You know, everybody else, it's a broad-based tax. But the other thing that's really interesting, if you look at, a, at the budget, the budget has about $100 billion, say, here, 200 per biennium, but $100 billion, it has a cap. They can't go past the cap. If you do property tax reduction of $4 billion, like the Senate had put forth, then you can only spend $96 billion. You're, you're limiting the growth of government. But if you do sales tax, that doesn't count against the budget. So when you don't count against the budget, that means you now have an extra $4 billion that the government can grow on one side. Not for growing more government. I'm for a broader base tax. And, not want, and for more property tax reduction. I personally think we ought to do away with the property tax altogether and go straight to a sales tax. Mr. Serrier? We did have a plan for a sales tax reduction. Uh, studies show that Texas, in, in, in all categories of business and personal use, that we're ranked, you know, we always think Texas is always ranked in the top two, maybe in the top three of uh, business-friendly climates. We're actually ranked in about four and five in certain areas because of our sales tax. The study showed in the House and the work that we did that if we reduced our sales tax, we would actually create uh, a, a business environment for all of us that would reduce us down to, put us down into the top four, maybe even lower. But it's a continuing, continuing uh, reduction in taxes, whereas the property tax which I voted for, and I think it's great, and I agree that we need to we need to reduce our property, the burden on property taxes, was a drop in the bucket. It really reduced, I think it was an average of about $130 per household, and it's not going to be continuous. It's not going to be, you're not going to continue to see that over time. Mr. Goldman, you have a 30-second rebuttal. Um, John seems to bring up that on the, the House Bill 37 that I, I brought up that he seems to have voted differently. And I will go back and check the record, John, to make sure. But it may be very similar to the vote you made on House Bill 1891. That's a bill that uh, was against charter schools and for some, this thing, this new liberal thing called community, uh, community schools, in which John voted for it on second reading and against it on third reading. And I'll just tell you, as your state rep, you won't find me on both sides of an important issue. Because that way you can come back to folks like this and say, you know, depending upon what, where you sit in a room, I was for it and I was against it. Uh, question number 10. Mr. Serrier, other than your career or employment experiences, what personal life experiences do you feel have prepared you for service as a state representative? I was born and raised in Fort Worth. I was the youngest of four, and I attended all public schools. Uh, my father was a Marine, uh, passed away when I was 18. I share that with you because of the life experiences that I had with my father up to that age. I attended Texas A&M University where I was a distinguished student in mechanical engineering, and I was in the Corps of Cadets. I was an Air Force ROTC uh, student, and I was uh, in the Corps of Cadets. I was in the Aggie Band, where I was selected by my peers as to be the commander of the Fighting Tex Aggie Band. I'm an Eagle Scout, and that means a lot. I, uh, after college, I ended up being fortunate at the age of 26. I started a first branch office of a commercial general contracting company, and I found, found Central Texas, and I found Lockhart. Uh, with that experience, I was able to, at, in 2008, start my own business. I, I built that from the ground up. Uh, during that time, though, uh, I was also a county commissioner. Uh, spent, spent three years as a county commissioner working on all different types of issues. I'm only one of five, only one of five in the t Texas House that, that spent time as a rural county commissioner, really as a county commissioner. So having that background is invaluable. I've also spent many, many, uh, uh, many uh, years in, on committees and, and boards. Matter of fact, uh, before I was uh, elected as your state representative, I was on eight b different boards. Two of them, I was chair of those boards. Some of those are some of the largest nonprofit groups in Central Texas, besides being business organizations. Uh, Capital Area Food Bank was one of the boards that I spent uh, many hours on. Uh, Caritas of Austin is one of the largest nonprofit charity groups in Central Texas. So my experiences just in life at a young age, uh, I feel has uh, proven to uh, be 
good to be a state rep and many others feel the same way when they come up to me on the House floor and ask me about certain bills and certain things because they know of those experiences. Mr. Goldman? Um, I'm a reformed attorney. That means I'm the second best kind of attorney, the best one being a dead one, I'm a non-practicing one. Uh, you know, I tell folks and I go around, I've knocked on a lot of doors, I've met a lot of, a lot of people. And, you know, I, I'm a Christian, I'm a husband, and I'm a father, and those are the three titles that I care about, and those are the three titles that drive me. My faith plays a very large role in my life. It always has, and it always will. Um, my wife, you know, has always been there for me, and our children have drastically changed the way that I view life. And for those of us, it's just, you look at their education, you look at their health, you look at their future, you look at what you're going to be leaving them, and you see it and you watch it every day. And that, more than anything else, is probably what drives me to get up and do just about everything every day. I'm truly blessed to get to have such a wonderful family, to get to live in a community like we live in, to get to serve that community in many ways, and you can look it all up online. I'm, you know, I, I feel as though we've, you know, but more than anything else, it's getting to get out and meet the people. You know, I've, I'm fed up with Austin. I was fed up when I left 14 years ago with Austin. It's just gotten a lot worse. And so I'm, I would throw my talents back at you and say, I can go up there. I can serve us well. I will serve us for a short period of time because I have no desire to spend more than about three or four terms up there because I think that's what you should do. You should go spend your time, serve your community, whether it's the Youth Football League or the Texas House of Representatives. Go serve it for about six to eight years, then go back to doing whatever it was you did. And that's what I feel. Mr. Siri, do you want to use your 30-second rebuttal? I'll just say that, I, again, I'm, I'm not a career politician, um, but I do love serving our state. I do love serving our district. Uh, these life experiences have shaped me, uh, the things that I've been able to do at a young age. It is, uh, but it's my desire to continue to do the right things for District 17 and do the right things for the, the, the neighbors and the people that I care about and the, and the people that all the way from Lee County all the way down to Carnes County. Thank you. And we're going to start with questions from the audience. We'll begin with Mr. Goldman. Would the candidates please address an issue that they anticipate in the next legislative session specific to K through 12 education? Please share your interest in or opinion of this issue. Well, I would fathom that the, the Senate will go back to work and file the same school reform bills that they filed last time. And that this time they'll come over to a house that'll hopefully be a little more receptive, especially to school choice. And choice is just that, folks. It says the state's not to raise your child. You as a parent are to raise the child. You're biblically called to raise a child. It's not the state. And so we've got a backward system right now where we have a, we have a mindset of sort of drop the child off at three and pick them up at 18. And that's, that's not serving us well. They have no choice. A lot of parents, I've coached a lot of single moms, a lot of folks in our community and they're in, in youth football through the years, and I watch as they, they say, Brent, you know, can, can he play for you all year round? Because that's the only way he ever stays disciplined. And I say, you know, but I don't, I don't want to go to this school. I want to go to somewhere else. I want to go do this, that, or the other. And they ought to be able to have that choice. And choice doesn't mean, you know, it, choice is just that, another public school. You could go to an open enrollment school somewhere else. You could go to a charter school. You could go to a university model school. It's about the money following the child because they choose to go to where, and then that way that parent is invested. We want our parents invested in their children. We don't want them saying, well, you know what? I, you know, take them, I guess, because they have no other choice. And then they don't discipline them. And then you have all the problems. And choice also brings up, the focus is on teachers and not on anything else. We need to get back to where the dollars go straight down to the classrooms. In 1970, two and a half dollars went to a classroom, folks, for every one dollar of administration. Today it's one to one. It's completely and totally backwards and upside down, and if I'm in the Texas legislature, I will work diligently and hard to see that Senate legislation get through the House. 
Mr. Syrian. Education is the backbone for all our communities. We, we all want choices. We all want the best, uh, best for our children. But if we go down the route that the Senate was proposing and defund our public education, that would be detrimental to these rural communities. It would be detrimental to Bastrop County. It would be detrimental to the other communities. We cannot go down that route. Uh, I am all for working together and figuring out how to uh, come up with new, new ways to help uh, create other choices, be in other types of schools in our system. I like the idea of having a uh, competition and to drive us all to be better. I agree, we all agree, that we want to be better. We need to do some things to help our public education. But to defund our public education is not the right way to do it. And I tell you, the, the, the allowing taxpayers' money to get out without accountability is not the right thing. We need accountability for those taxpayers' dollars. Um, what Mr. Goldman is suggesting and what he's recommending is basically releasing those monies out for people to do whatever they need to do or what they feel they need to do. And that would absolutely hurt and crush our public school system. Mr. Goldman, you have a 30-second rebuttal. Well, I checked the fiscal notes on those bills. They're revenue neutral. If anything, they're revenue positive. Some of them actually put more money into public education, and that's a big fight in and of itself. You know, you take the child out but leave more money for public education. There's some people that say, hey, let's not do that. But, you know, I guess the part that caught me the most was, you know, parents don't know what they're doing with their children. How can we could trust them to do the right thing? I, I disagree. I believe parents love their children. I believe poor parents love their children, rural parents, black, white, green, gray, whatever, love their children and will do the best for them. Difference of opinion. The next question will begin with Mr. Syria. What will you do as my legislator to ensure that the Texas Retirement Pension Fund and TRS Care health insurance programs are preserved and improved? One of the very first votes that uh, I took on the House floor was actually to make sure that teachers' retirement was funded. I was proud to do that vote. I was proud to take that vote. That is a, uh, that is a service and a, and a commitment that we have made uh, to our teachers. Um, I will continue to support our teachers. I'll continue to uh, help recruit good educators and bring new educators into the field. But I'm also going to remind myself and remind others that these are the teachers that helped educate our children up to this point, and we owe it to them to take care of them as we had promised. Mr. Goldman? Uh, TRS and ERS are, you know, constitutionally protected and, and will be. But let's face it, if you haven't checked out recently, interest rates haven't been very high. The way that TRS and ERS work is on a projected value of actually making money on your money over a period of time. Those people that are currently in the system and you know, there's a magical age you can play between 40 and up, those funds are there and they will be there. But moving forward, as we have problems with funding Medicaid, which is going out of control, as we have low interest rates so we can't get the kind of return on the, on the money that we used to get when we had them in those funds, we've got to look at options. Look at pension funds, folks, of the private companies. They've outsourced. They're 401k plans. They're different types of, of financing structures. They have to be because they want to do what's best for their employees and make sure that they have money at the end. If we don't change the way in which we, as a state, operate those plans for those younger people, they're not going to see the same kinds of returns on those dollars. And I strongly uh, encourage legislation, and it's been filed, but it needs to get serious at some point, because right now as a state, we have a number of things that are pushing down on us. One is revenues aren't always ticking up like they, they have been. Oil and gas is you know, taking a, a bit. We have Medicaid. At one time, it was about, when I was at the legislature, about 5% of the budget. It's grown to almost 20% of the budget. It's projected to be 35 to 40% of the budget. It's going to outpace education spending. That's, so I mean, when you're looking at it and you're looking at how are you gonna fund retirement plans? How are you gonna do some of the other things? How are you gonna find money for fire relief like we talked about earlier? You're gonna need to look at the, at the way in which we go about funding and we're gonna have to get a little bit smarter with the dollars that we have. 
Mr. Syria, you have a 30 second rebuttal. I will continue to take care of our veterans. I will continue to take care of the emergency responders, the teachers, those that have, that protect us, those that educate us. I will continue to uh, take care of the people that are the ones that, that make us a great state. And in terms of the funds, we are fortunate that we do have the funds and we have been fiscal responsible through this uh, as a state. And we do have the, the, the moral responsibility to take care of those people. Thank you. The next question from the audience is a two-parter. We'll begin with Mr. Goldman. What is your position on same-day voter registration, where you can register to vote on election day? And do you think Texas should institute registering voters with a particular partisan affiliation? I'm not in favor of registering with a particular party affiliation at all. I believe that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I can't imagine making somebody be a Republican or a Democrat or an independent or anything going into, um, you know, I personally, I, I, I vote for the individual. I always have, and I always will, because, you know, that's what, in the end, that's what you want. You want people that are going to represent your interests. And, you know, we all know through a period of time, those party labels have changed and, and you know, deviated. Uh, in terms of same day registration, I, I, not in, I don't, I'm not really in favor unless we can figure out a way to do it accurately. I mean, I think we have a pretty good registration process. We allow you to register up until 15 days before the, um, you know, early voting starts. That's better than most states out there. We have one of the most, now I will tell you on the, on the ballot, I think that you, we ought to do away with the uh, check one box. I think you ought to be able to, ha you have to, should have to at least go down and check all the boxes so you can at least make a, an attempt to uh, understand what you're voting for. Um, you know, I, I'm not a big fan of uh, one box check and that, but that, I know that wasn't part of the question, so I'll That's stop okay. there. Mr. Siri? Um, I don't think that you should have to register as a Republican or an Independent or a Democrat. Um, on the one day, on the one day process, if it's, if the program is vetted and that's, uh, and it's correct, then I could see that uh, possibly leaning towards that. Um, it is a, uh, I've, I've been in an alternate election judge. I've sat in the polling locations. I have seen people come in and, and they have voted straight ticket and not knowing what the, what the people or who the people are. I, I agree that we should uh, eliminate straight ticket uh, voting. I think that that is a, uh, not a good practice and I think people should know the candidates and know who they're voting for. Mr. Goldman, do you want to respond? No, no. Oh, okay. No, no, thank you. This question will start with Mr. Syria. A lot was achieved for the district in the last session. What do you plan for the next session? Thank you. I appreciate you recognizing that a lot was achieved for District 17, and a lot of effort was put, put forth during this last 84th legislative session not only by myself, but many of y'all in this room and many of y'all in this district. Uh, there is uh, a lot of challenges. I will have to say that when I uh, walked in seven weeks late into the session and only nine days to follow our legislation, there were some things that were being backed up, things that hadn't been moving forward in our district. Um, I asked for a full term. I would like to have an, uh, this interim to plan our next, our next steps. I've been working on continuing on some of our water bills. Uh, the couple of bills, they were very tough. I was asked as a freshman what I, was, what I was thinking or what I was trying to do, trying to put legislation that was so so tough forward. Uh, we're gonna continue on that. Bills like that take time. They don't happen in one session. They take time. And I wanna continue on that work. I wanna continue to work with citizen groups and, and the citizens to find out more of what we need uh, and I want to continue to push forward to make sure that Bastrop County, Lee County, and the other counties are, are represented well and that people know who we are and we have the relationships. So if we ever in time of needs, we can pull on those relationships and make sure that we are taken care of. Mr. Goldman. I can tell you that my approach to 
working legislation through the legislative process will probably be very different than most people who apply for this job, so to speak. Um, a lot of people like to get names on bills and get things through and say, I got this over this body or that body or uh, because, you know, I guess the thought process is when you come back to the folks and say, I did this, that, and the other, I got all this accomplished. But I can tell you right now from experience, the best, most effective legislators I ever witnessed, and I had a catbird seat. I was technically press, you know, we got to be on the House floors and the Senate floors, and we got to kind of watch and listen as things were going on. But the people that worked the process the best were the ones that never threw their name on anything. They just got their stuff in over here, they got their stuff in over there because they did not, they were willing to check their pride at the door and say, you know what, you go, put, you go be the hero. And you know what, you get a lot more done when you let somebody else be the hero on the, in the Texas legislature. And so I will put to you, there are a lot of things, water bills being one of them, limited government being another, education reform being another, there are many ideas and things that, you know, I know that we can get done, but my, my tack and the way I'll go about doing it is not to come back here and say, hey, I, fi I got this bill or I got that bill. Hopefully I can come back and just say, hey, we as a group did some really good things, and I was a part of it. Mr. Siri? One of the things I learned early on uh, was when we were uh, approving the $210 billion budget, that was a... Uh, it took 17 hours on the House floor, which I did not leave that House floor until that budget was done. But about 2.30 in the morning, a representative from the Dallas-Fort Worth area said that he would like to remove $900,000 from the budget. I'm up for everything to be looked at and scrutinized. To remove $900,000 from the hog eradication program because he said that there was no hog problem in the state of Texas anymore. <laughs> I learned real quick, I learned real quick a lot of this is playing defense. A lot of this is protecting our rural values. I'm one of less than 60. I'm one of less than 60 out of 150 that represents a rural district like ours. And, and looking after that, it's not about creating bills. It's about paying attention and watching over and playing defense and making sure that we are not being run over by urban areas and others that are going to take away our values. Thank you. Ms. Jackson, do we have time for another question or should we go to closing statements? Do we have time for another question or should we go to, we do? Okay. This one was directed to Mr. Goldman. You have, and it's in line with another question we dealt with earlier. You have stated that you are in line with our Lieutenant Governor and Governor with regard to school choice. Our Lieutenant Governor, Dan Patrick, has stated that he wants state fund state funded education dollars to quote follow the student to private schools and to parents homeschooling their children how would we and should we validate and hold accountable those dollars and the people receiving such the accountability uh, I have no problem with the, the, the dollars following the child none whatsoever As a matter of fact that is that empowers the, the parent empowers the, the Student, it also allows teachers to move out into environments where they can be, where they don't have to be heavily regulated, where they can actually teach again, where they're not having to look over their shoulder and teach to a test. These are all positive things. So, I mean, the, the school choice is about not just all of a sudden there being a vacuum. It, it reminds me of the fact that we somehow needed to bail out GM like they were never going to build another car tomorrow. No, we didn't need to bail out GM because Ford would pick it up, somebody else would pick it up. Right? Well, the same thing with education. The dollars are going to go outside. Some are going to stay back inside the public education system, which is going to actually allow more funds for public education because not all the dollars are following the child. But when those dollars do go out, the educators will go out with them, and they will move into those verticals. And so I do believe, and in terms of how we will, we will have accountability, there are, there are already uh, platforms for accountability built into those bills. That's where the fight is. Over how I've never seen any of those where uh, homeschooling was an option. Um, I, I I think most homeschoolers, and Cynthia and I do homeschool, are pretty much opposed for the state doing anything and don't get close to the state and don't want to be regulated in any way, shape, or form by the state. So what we're talking about here is not homeschool. We're talking about uh, private schools, charter schools, university model schools, other types of things that have 
uh, a more formal structure to them. But, you know, what we, we certainly have, you know, when parents interject themselves into those and choose to take those choices, they're going to have to have some levels of accountability. And, but they don't have to have state tests every, every year, and they're not gonna have to have all the restrictions that public schools have today. Mr. Siri. Uh, accountability is the main concern that, that we all have, and that's uh, the accountability of taxpayers' money. Um, if, if, if you have a requirement on our public school system, but you're not going to require the same uh, requirements on other uh, groups, then it sets an unfair balance. Uh, so accountability in terms of figuring out what this, how you set that up and how you do that uh, is, is the important question. Um, I disagree with, uh, I disagree that we're going to take money away from our public school system. It's not, that's not the right thing to do, and it's not right to uh, the taxpayers as well. Mr. Goldman, you have a 30 second rebuttal. Okay. There's this thing called a fiscal note. It tells you whether something's positive or negative. In other words, it takes money away or it puts money back in. Go look at the bills. They have positive fiscal notes. Get over the fact it's not taking money out of public education. But the unfair balance, that's what I would like to create. The reason I say that is I would like for our schools to say, you know what, get rid of these regs, get rid of this red tape, throw off this yoke of government so that we can get back to teaching our kids. That's what public schools need, and this is why school choice will bring that. Okay, we'll go now to closing statements, and we'll begin with Mr. Goldman. I guess uh, I probably should address the way this all started out was, you know, Brent Goldman lies. Uh, that's what John started with uh, in his opening remarks. So I guess I'll close with, well, you heard my lies tonight. So you can judge for yourself because these are the things that I've said. You know, my lies are simply this. I don't characterize, you know, tort reform as water legislation. John does. You can decide for yourself, but that's not a lie. That's just two people disagreeing over what you call a particular type of bill. I just point to the fact that the Texans for Lawsuit Reform claim it's one of the best lawsuit for reform bills in the legislation. I'm, again, not opposed to frivolous lawsuits. You know, you're going you're gonna to hear, I, we're going to stay on point. Last time in this election, John said I lied too. And then John said I attacked his family, and John said I had a dad that's a you know, that's a nefarious big time lobbyist and that I took $250,000 from water marketers and the list goes on and on. None of those are true, but I'll, I'll put to you this. John puts on his mail pieces that he has right to life as, uh, you know, well, John, does right to life endorse you? Because I believe the only person on this stage that's ever been endorsed by right to life is me. John has te Texans for Fiscal Responsibility on his mail pieces. John, have they endorsed you? I realize you're in their top 25, but they've endorsed everybody else. Why not you? So, you know, what I would put to you is that you're going to hear a lot coming out over the course of the next four weeks. Unfortunately, I can't control. You're going to hear nothing but factual stuff from us that you can look up on the Internet and find, voting records, all that kind of stuff. So I'd ask you to, you know, buckle up, hang in there. We're going to do the same. Thank you very much. God bless, and y'all have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Mr. Siri. Many people thank me for my sacrifice for being your state representative. Uh, that is my decision and my honor. It's my wife, Rochelle, and my coworkers that are the ones that truly make the sacrifices. I want to publicly thank them for doing just that. I want to leave here, I want you to leave here tonight and reflect on what you heard what was campaign rhetoric, and what was proven facts. I ask for your support again. This is our third election for five counties in one year. I ask for a full term as your state representative. 168,000 people are counting on me, and I take that very seriously. After being sworn in on the House floor on March 1st, I took 1,791 votes for District 17, not missing one. But being a good state rep is more than just casting votes. It's also about being accessible and engaged with the community. It's about being entrusted with our future. Help me continue to fight for our children's education. 
Help me to continue to protect our most precious resource, water. Help me limit the destruction and prepare the destruction and prepare for future natural disasters in our community and state. Help me continue to grow and retain our businesses for our future prosperity and quality of life. It's been a great honor to be your state representative, and as I look out, we have created uh, lifetime, lifetime relationships and friendships in a short period of time. I ask for a full term as your state representative. Uh, please reelect me, John Sirier, as your state representative. And I want to thank Becky and Lee and the Bastrop Chamber of Commerce for putting on this forum tonight. God bless District 17 and God bless the great state of Texas. Thank you. I'd like to thank both the participants and I'll turn it over to Becky now. Again, these forums were a great effort on a countywide level and also um, the five counties that we represent, but I need to thank some people who helped pull this off. One, I need to thank BISD and particularly Steve Murray for allowing us to use this facility. Uh, we had 100 pe 180 people in attendance tonight. This forum was also used as a teaching opportunity with Bastrop ISD. And on our cameras tonight were students from the AV departments at the high schools. So give these kiddos a round of applause, please. And then I need to thank the IT department, Colin and um, Andreas, for uh, helping us live stream this. We had 174 people watching online at the same time you were watching it live. So thank you, IT department, Bastrop. See you, Bastrop. Um, hopefully we will have this on our website no later than about 5 o'clock tomorrow, maybe earlier, but you can go back and look at it online, uh, the full version of the forum. I uh, also want to thank the Elgin and Smithfield Chambers. Gina's in attendance again, so thank you for their support of this initiative. And then also our Government Affairs Committee, especially Lee Harrell. This was his brainchild. Um, I missed last week a very talented staffer, uh, Mr. Chamber Rick, back there, waving his hand. Um, if it was not for him, we could have not gotten this website launched in two weeks. You would not see the graphics that you see or any of the brochures, so please give him a round of applause. He's my man behind the scenes, really supports me. Um, also, I've missed the Bastrop Advertiser. Uh, Julian and Andy have helped us tremendously in getting the word out of these forums, so I want to thank them and for all their publicity. <laughs> and then also, I want to thank these candidates for trusting us for this forum to do something that was professional, well run. Um, it's not fun being on this hot seat and not knowing what questions were coming at you, so I want to thank you both for being here. Thank you. Please watch for updates on BastropVotes.com. We know that we will have a contested race for city council. We don't know about school board yet, but we do plan on having forums for both of those races as well. So thank you for your attendance and have a safe trip home. <laughs> <laughs> She's a Thank you very much. You're welcome.